thanks for all, to all of you for being here, and thanks for inviting me to moderate this rather complicated session. Since one of our discussants, unfortunately, is ill, I thought I'd take another minute or two to try to uh, talk about some issues that have occupied me for quite a long time on this topic and that perhaps are more, of more foundational nature. The way one usually, the usual arguments against the state involvement range between political arguments, range from political arguments to the arguments concerning the fact that the state cannot really know enough to know what to do. I will omit the first part, although that is not unimportant. We heard how important it is just in the previous session in a talk by Tom Ferguson. I would like to talk about the second part because that's how I see the three different components here playing out on a more foundational level. To, not to spend too much time, I just wanted to report on some research that I had done with Andrzej Rapaczynski quite a while ago on the Europe, East European transition, which I think is perhaps somewhat informative about the difficulties of the issues that we face, just very briefly, and then I will turn it over to the panel with perhaps a concluding remark. That research was a firm level research to find out what is the real difference between state firms and firms that are privatized. So that introduces not just the element of knowledge, but also the element of ownership, and therefore it gets back to the key issues about capitalism, which are both dealing with imperfect knowledge, and it's the system that is fundamentally based on private property. So the question is, when is private property really important? And it turns out that for as long as we're dealing with routine activities, which the state firms are perfectly capable of undertaking the moment the political rent-seeking disappears, which it did, of course, with the collapse, the very collapse of the state under communists had made it impossible for the states to deliver their usual subsidies. The key difference is actually not on those activities, but it's on the activities that have to do with innovation. The rates of growth uh, differ by an order of 10-15% between the privatized firms and the state firms. That, of course, it has been interpreted by many as meaning that privatization is the answer to all. And I don't think it necessarily should be, and that's what our panel will address. So in view of the fact that the state cannot know everything, and that we need the market and private property to address the questions of imperfect knowledge and non-routine change that go to the heart, particularly of the innovation part of the economy, what is the role of the state in that part? We hope we've have a very distinguished panel that I think each one of, the, uh, uh, of our panelists have addressed this question from a different point of view and in quite some depth, so we hope to get an enlightenment on that. Then there are some broader issues. There's another aspect of this, which is infrastructure. And that has to do with the, the, the particularly current example of the, of the importance of that question is, can infrastructure investment on the part of the state now be effective but not in a standard rate of return sense, but can it be effective to actually increase the rate of productivity growth to the point that actually would repay the state investment? It's sort of the, the supply side argument of Ronald Reagan now turned to the question of state investment and changes in productivity. Some of the figures that Rob Johnson had had in a really interesting recent presentation suggest the affirmative answer to that. So the question of infrastructure then is, can the state deliver it effectively, and what are the systemic effects of it, and therefore could that be helpful for medium-term fiscal consolidation? That, I'm not sure we'll get to it, but perhaps we could. So at least I want to pose this as a question. That, of course, would link up this session with the other sessions. And then I'm not sure how much we will do on education, but I do know that we'll do something on the a question of innovative enterprise and what it really means and how it links to other enterprises, what are the macroeconomic effects of it, what are the corporate governance issues, which go back to the ownership and political questions. So we have quite a rich variety of issues here. So let me turn to the panel without undue delay. Our first speaker is Philippe Aguillon from Harvard University. Thank you very much. 
God, where did I put my, uh, I look for my, the thing I'm supposed to use. Here we are. <coughs> Thanks very much, Roman, for inviting me. <laughs> um, so the, the title of my presentation is uh, Rethinking Growth and, uh, and the State. Um, so since the 1980s, uh, uh, market flexibility has increasingly appeared and, and been advocated as a necessary input to innovation growth, particularly in developed economies. So it's been the kind of, uh, you know, the Reagan Thatcher, but also it's true that there have been a number of studies showing that, uh, you know, for innovation-led growth, uh, uh, liberalization of market, market flexibility, trade liberalization, are good for innovation-led growth. So, um, so, so the, the, this, so now we, are, we broadly, and here in this uh, in that, uh, assembly, I think we are all uh, uh, acknowledging the fact that market flexibility, competition, uh, uh, are uh, uh, engines of growth. Uh, the question is, what are the implications of that for the role of the state in the growth process? Now, uh, the fact that, that you know, market flexibility is recognized as a necessary input to growth has led some scholars and politicians to advocate a reduction in the role and in the size of the government. So in fact, uh, and, and you might have thought that the recent crisis would have uh, put an end to this, uh, to this trend, but you know uh, Cameron is there uh, uh, to do uh, exactly, you know, minimize uh, t tax uh, spending and, 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 and tax, uh, uh, the Tea Party, and, uh, uh, and also in, in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, I, you know, each time, I, very often I meet people, you know, from Czech Republic or other places, and they tell me, you know, why, you know why Western grow, Europe is not growing? It's because you have the wealth, it's because you, you have not privatized social security, you should privatize all, that, all those sectors, and there you would go. So it's a very deep-rooted uh, uh, belief, you know, that flexibility is synonymous, synonymous of a minimal state, okay? And there I want to show you, what I want to advocate here is that this idea is wrong. It's not a good idea. Uh, uh, so uh, the, what I will uh, uh, contend is that market flexibility and innovation-based growth, they do not require less state. They require state differently. And I will try to talk about some dimensions where the state has to move away from the old welfare state, the old top-down approach, to something which is more friendly to market flexibility. So uh, uh, in particular, I will, I will mention two roles that government or state need to have in the globalized economy. One is an, as an investor in growth. The other one is as an insurer in you the new, against the new market risks. And those roles lead us to rethink the design of fiscal policy. In particular, how should, we, how should we factor in innovation and growth when designing optimal tax policy, which is a broadly, a widely open area for research. There's been a big enterprise on tax reform, which is the Merlis Review, for those who have heard about that. There is not a single word about innovation there for the moment, and they acknowledge it. And that, I think, is a big next step in thinking about tax reform. Okay, so let me start with the state as an investor. So uh, 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 this figure, which is drawn from research by Wassman and Hanushek, shows the positive correlation is cross-country study. The, the vertical axis is average growth rate between 1960 and 2000, and the horizontal axis is PISA test. And you see, you see a positive relationship between the, not the, the quality of education, which is measured by the PISA. PISA is, a, is an index that measures the quality of, I would say, primary, secondary education and growth. So uh, there are other, I could have shown other figures showing the you know, enrollment in education or spending in education. But it's very interesting that you see really that there is a, a big thing to education and growth. And this does not only reflect the fact that education is a factor of production. Uh, there is very much the Nelson Phelps view that more education allows a country to catch up more quickly with more advanced technologies or to innovate more quickly. So education and growth is important. The other one is health and growth. Health is another form of human capital. And, and health also, the, what this table shows is that there is a very positive correlation between 
uh, uh, growth and uh, the initial life expectancy or the variation of life expectancy, which means that health is also exactly like education. Uh, having a population in better health helps you innovate better and catch up more quickly with uh, more uh, innovative technologies. Okay, so, so those, I guess you'd say, well, we know that. Well, we know it's not so clear because for health, for example, in the whole debate on the health, you know, with Obama, between Obama and the Republicans, I've seen very little argument that health creates value. Health is not only a cost, health creates value. And that I have not seen that much pictured uh, uh, in the debate on health reform. Now, I want now to become controversial, and uh, that here is coming the first really controversial uh, idea to you, is that uh, 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 I believe also beyond what I call the horizontal targeting, R&D, health, education, I believe that maybe some, some vertical targeting, some sectoral policy might be worth thinking about. Now, maybe most of you will hate the idea, but in, in it is supposed to, add, uh, to put forward controversial ideas, so here we go, okay? So uh, over time, uh, uh, so we know, we know there was this kind of old infant industry argument for why you should have protect, pro temporary protection of sectors in uh, uh, developed economies so that they have time you know, to develop sectors that can have knowledge externalities on the rest of the economy. Joe Stiglitz, who is not there, but you know, has worked uh, uh, with uh, Greenwald and others and, and, and been uh, other work on this. Now, vertical, uh, now, over time, particularly since the 1980s, economists have come on, uh, to dislike industrial policy on two grounds. First, it focuses on big incumbents, national champions, and second, are government grade to pick winners. So, Anne Kruger and others have to come to say, well, this is rubbish. Forget about industrial policy, don't do this. Just do market liberalization and off you go and have a completely bottom up, no more sectoral policy. Now, on the, on the, on the other hand, a number of countries in the world, uh, and in Europe, for example, Germany and others, do in fact uh, some form of industrial policy. They may call it structural policy, they may call it another name, but they do industrial policy. Of course, China does, Asian countries do. Uh, uh, the U.S. do in their way. So I think about industrial policy is very much the don't ask, don't tell. You see what I mean? Don't ask if I do it, uh, don't tell. Uh, if the, and, uh, 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 and now uh, the problem is I think instead of doing, you know, like we did with the don't ask, don't tell, uh, and, and have some people do industrial policy badly, why not acknowledge that there is something called industrial policy, but then instead of saying reject it altogether, why not think about how to do it better uh, uh, to govern it better so as to avoid first order mistakes. So let's get away from the don't ask, don't tell, acknowledge that industrial policy is a reality. How could you do it better? So uh, um, uh, there have been various studies there, recent, empirical, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and so for example, uh, Nunn and Treffler uh, have, uh, Treffler is an economist at the University of Toronto, Nathan Nunn is a colleague of mine at Harvard. They have a very interesting paper in the American Economic Journal 2010 when they show that skill bias targeting is growth enhancing. So, I mean, if you target sectors that are skill biased, you have an impact on growth. So that means that the choice of sector, you can have some guiding principles. Uh, <coughs> with, uh, uh, with Asemoglu, uh, Burstin, and Emus, I've done some work uh, on climate, showing that the choice of firms, whether to innovate dirty or clean, uh, in clean technology or dirty technology, is what I call past dependent. When you've done more dirty in the past, you do more dirty in the future. So for example, here, uh, 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 to show this, I have, uh, we looked at the automotive, so you know, the related paper with John Van Rinen, we look at automotive industry during the period 1978, 2007. We classify patents between clean patents in electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, or dirty technologies, regular combustion engines. We have 12,000 patents in clean, 36 patents in dirty, and we know the name of the patent holder. What this table, which is a bit too small for you to look, shows, is that there is past dependence in the direction of technical change. Those who have innovated more clean in the past innovate more clean in the future. But those who are most numerous who innovated more dirty in the past innovate more dirty in the future. It means that if you still you keep laissez-faire and the state does not intervene, we will keep on innovating in dirty technologies 
and we will, uh, uh, we will uh, worsen environmental problem. So if you want to get about, uh, out of that, you need to redirect technical change away from dirty towards clean. Okay, so that's another justification for sectoral policy. Okay, so that's the, uh, uh, that's the second justification. The third justification is, uh, is that if you target sectors that are competitive, and if you target sectors in a way that you just, don't just target one firm, but one sector, and you don't give all the subsidies to one firm, you maintain competition. You see what I mean? Because we know competition is good. But the idea that competition and industrial policy should be opposed is not, absolute, is not necessary at all. You could do industrial policy in a way which is what I call competition friendly. So this is current work with Anne Harrison, which is from the World Bank and Berkeley and other co-authors, and, uh, uh, and is this kind of table. What this kind of table tells you is that when you target sectors which are more, uh, 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 more competitive and you do it in a way which is more competition friendly, you spread out the, the, the subsidies among more firms, there the growth effects are more likely to be positive than if you do concentrated aid. More generally, there is a whole way to govern industrial policy. Get away from the Ann Kruger view, industrial policy is all bad. Think about how to do it in a competition-friendly way. Okay, so that's my kind of first big uh, point I want to make uh, in, this, in this thing. So uh, I want now to move to the role of state as an insurer. Well, you know, I don't need to talk here about the well, you know, to, you know how could we avoid systemic financial crises. Uh, uh, there is also the labor market risk. And there, of course, the Danish system of flexi security is very important. They have a system where they combine flexibility of firms to hire and fire and state policy to uh, uh, train workers and help them rebound from job to job. The combination of the two has shown to be extremely good for employment, to reduce long-term employment, and to be growth enhancing. I think that, that kind of labor market policy, Germany is also having very active labor market policy, I think this is the future. I think go modern governments should invest in what I call flex security, this mixture of flexibility and labor market training. So that, I think, is a big deal. But I want to talk about something else here. I want to talk about the macroeconomic risk, how to conduct macroeconomic policy so, uh, over the cycle so as to preserve innovation and growth. So to be a bit controversial, I could say there are two extremes. There is what I call the old-fashioned Keynesians, uh, uh, who says, well, when you have a recession, spend in indiscriminately in anything you can and, and, and get the demand to go up and play on the short-run multiplier. And then there is the opposite view, which is to say tax, cut, cut tax and spending. If you, talk, if you cut tax, firms is, are more profitable, and you cut spending, interest rate go down, and all that will make firms more innovative, more active, and it will trickle down to the whole system. Okay? So now we know the problem is that there are no evidence of short-run Keynesian multiplier. There have been big debates on the Keynesian multiplier, and, uh, and people don't agree. I mean, it's fair to say that it's a controversial issue. Okay, and uh, on the other hand, we know that doing nothing in recession, excessive spending cuts may harm govern, uh, growth enhancing investment. So what do you do uh, between the two? So here, that's my second idea in this talk, is to propose a compromise between the, the two approach. And what I, what my view is a Schumpeterian view, not a Keynesian view, is that you need counter-cyclical fiscal and monetary policy to help firms sustain growth enhancing investment like R&D, training, etc., cetera, uh, over the cycle. And in fact, what I've been doing uh, over the past uh, years uh, with various co-authors is, uh, is to use, in fact, uh, uh, cross-sector, cross-country panel data, 17 OECD countries, 45 manufacturing industries over the period 1980-2005, and I've shown that industries that are more credit constrained or more liquidity constrained, the growth in those industries benefit more for counter-cyclical fiscal, that means where you run deficits in recession and you reduce deficit in booms, or counter-cyclical monetary when you reduce interest rates, short-term real interest rate in the recession, and increase them in, in expansion. And what this, uh, uh, I have time, how much do I have? Two minutes? Can you give me a minute, three minutes more? A minus, okay. So what this shows is that you have a, 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 a positive interaction when you are more credit constrained, counter-cyclical policies work, but it's not just for the, the short-run uh, multiplier, it's because of the fact that you help firms maintain uh, 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 investment. So in fact, you know, you, have, you know the notion of automatic stabilizer, where you would like to extend it to things like subsidies to innovating firms, R&D, 
subsidy to skills, those things should also be subject, I think, to automatic stabilizers. Okay, so now let me move to the next thing, the fiscal pillar, and now I'm going very fast. I think there are uh, uh, three requirements from tax policy. Tax policy must see the good return to finance public good investments. It must not discourage innovation. It should be fair in order to enhance trust and social capital. So uh, the findings we have on tax policies is raising taxes may enhance growth in high government efficiency or low corruption. And uh, uh, so here are figures. If I restrict uh, to high corruption OECD countries, tax and growth are negatively correlated. For low corruption countries, they are positively correlated. Those results are true if you go across uh, US states or across US counties. So it means that all depends when you do tax policy and you look at the effect of tax on growth, you should look how the money is spent and people are more willing to pay tax when they know the money is well spent and when they know other people are also paying tax. And the effect on innovation are very different. But more generally, there is this whole view that you have to think to put innovation into the design, the optimal tax design. Uh, uh, I, uh, um, I think I should, I should conclude here. I won't have time to talk about trust and why you should have a fair uh, tax system. Let me just conclude. Market flexibility and innovation call for, not for less state, but from sta for state differently. You want state as an investor in R&D, education, green innovation, new industrial policy. You want state as an insurer, labor market policy, macro policy over the cycle. And this leads you, must lead you to rethink the design of, uh, of fiscal policy. I think I will stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>